Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Daphina Roberts, and um, I am a writer, director, and producer, and also screenwriting instructor uh, here at New York Film Academy. And I would love to introduce you all to, I'm sure you already know her, uh, Tanya Saracho. Um, so please come on, Tanya. Um, Tanya is an amazing playwright and television writer. She served as the creator showrunner and executive producer of the critically acclaimed stars series Vida. Uh, she it featured all Latinx directors in season one and all Latina directors in season two and three, uh, as well as the series had an all Latinx writers room in season one and two and an all Latina uh, writers room in season three. Um, her credits also include Looking, Devious Maids, How to Get Away with Murder and Girls. She is the founder of Teatro Luna, the first all Latina theater company in the nation, as well as founder of Alta, the Alliance of Latino Theater Artists. Uh, Tanya, woohoo! Hi. I'm so, so, so excited to have you here to talk to us about all the things. Um, so just so everyone has a heads up, the first 40 minutes will be my questions and some questions that you all sent in um, previous to the event. Everyone seemed pretty excited. So I got a few um, questions prior to this event. And then in the last 20 minutes, I'll be pulling questions from the Q&A. And if I see any questions that feel like they're kind of a part of uh, the questions that I'm asking, I'll also try to pull those in as well. Um, so let's get started and I'll kind of go back a little bit back and forth. But um, can you talk to me about, um, after all your amazing work in theater, uh, can you talk about that transition into TV? Um, I have read an article where you talked about um, the challenges of, of being, being a diversity hire, um, as well as like the issues around imposter syndrome. So both, both in terms of just, you know, you transferring over, coming into a new, I guess, genre, if you will, um, but then also dealing with the industry and how they sometimes deal with um, people who are not, you know, cis straight white men. <laughs> yeah, it was a, a whole new way of storytelling that I didn't get mentally prepared for because it sort of just happened to me. I was doing a play in New York um, and, I've, uh, and I tell the story, but I'm gonna tell it. Like um, I got this email from an, an Uta guy that wanted to take me out for lunch um, to talk to me about TV writing and it was free lunch. So I was like, cause th that's the thing about being a playwright. Like um, I was on the cover of Time Out Chicago, but I couldn't pay my rent. Like it, it, and the playwrights don't get taken care of in the theater, you know, like it, it's really sad. Um, there's a book called Outrageous Fortune that like covered how like it's not set up for playwrights to eat from playwriting, you know? Anyway, and I was at that stage that it was going well, but what does that mean? Like I can, couldn't feed myself from it. Um, and then uh, I got this Uta email and I go and have, you know, lunch with this Uta guy and no one for two weeks told me, cause I was like saying Uta Uta, that they didn't tell me it was UTA, that, but I just didn't see periods. And I was like, Uta. Um, anyway, like nobody corrected me forever, which was really embarrassing. And, but I had, um, you know, uh, a, a lunch with this guy and this guy's like, you could write, you know, for TV. And he told me, you don't have to go back to school. Wrong. I should have. Um, because I, sh I did show up because I had a, a play going on in LA in January of that year. And, and so I did these general meetings that the guy was like, just, just go take meetings. That's all you have to do. I was like, I don't have to go to school. Okay. Um, but, but I, but that means I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know final draft outlines, pitching, I didn't know that writing for television was not writing. It was sitting around talking and <laughs> trying to outdo each other. I, I seriously, that first week I was like, when does the writing part happen? And I get it now. I get the process, but it's like for a storyteller um, that just like wrote in my little home office and just like, you know, all precious about it, like, um, and didn't have to basically like you just turn in script. You don't, it's not a collaborative art, art form until much later theater yeah. you know until the script is uh, has some shape you know um ugh, this uh tv writing was crazy um he just kept saying you know um because i guess i i i i told a story about my dad's mistress at our you you know uta lunch and my and 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 the uta was like tell that story about your dad's mistress at every general okay just tell it i didn't understand why but then i did because the thing is the play that he had read malayerba was about my dad's mistress and then we sold it to HBO like a year later so he had like a plan but I didn't know I just knew that like I needed to go to Taco like 
spill all my dad's teeth and got, you know, um, <laughs> he didn't know I was doing that, you know, but, um, but then I landed a job without understanding that I was landing a job. I thought I was going through just generals, but <clears throat> because I don't have any, I didn't have any training. Um, I didn't know that you were supposed to read the script, have a meeting about, the, I still don't know how I got staffed, <laughs> you know, but I did. And then I started and then it was frankly horrible. The first year, it was not a good year. You know, it was like, like breaking bones and resetting. And it was just, you know, um, learning this thing and then surviving the politics of it too. And like you said, the first hour of this thing where I would, this was a show about five Latinas and I was the only Latina when I started. Then later on, my bestie Gloria Calderon Kellett came on, you know, like uh, a couple of months later, thank God. But it was, then we had a different kind of thing happen to both of us, you know? But like when, when I first got there, um, this guy was um, a coworker was walking with me to, uh, get our offices because they give you an office. I mean, it's it's also fancy too, like from being a playwright writing and like, to you know, you get your own office with this is crazy. Um, and we were walking and he like turns around, he's taller than me. He was like, um, you do know you're the diversity hire, right? He like straight up told me and I didn't know what the diversity hire was. I didn't know, I was like, what's that? And he, he goes, oh honey, that oh honey. It was like, wow, this doesn't feel right. So I called the Uta, I was like, Uta, what? what is a diversity hire? Cause in the theater, we don't have that term, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, he was like, I didn't want to tell you so that you didn't get it in your head, but um, uh, you, you just don't cost the show anything. Oh, so I have no value is what I heard, you know? But it really played out like that. Um, and I'm not saying every, um, every room handles a diversity writer that way. I know that like my three friends that I know that are now, showrunners or upper levels that went through that they it did happen some you know like microaggressions or like just other eyes marginalized like only speak for you know your your ethnicity or your color or your gender you know um and uh and it was just not cute you know <laughs> it was like not it was a really hard year I survived it and then went on to a, a show called looking and that was just oh that's what writing for TV is supposed to be, you know? Um, and it was really lovely because uh, my the showrunner uh, of Looking had never done TV before. He was like a, like a auteur filmmaker. And it was, and it was, all of us were queer. I was the only um, female there, but like it was, um, it was really lovely. And then I, that, I was like, it sort of a, uh, was licensed. So this is what you could do on television. So there's a lot of DNA on Looking and be that because like, we we got to go up to San Francisco to shoot not just our episodes like as a room we went up there which was really cool so like we saw how you know he was shooting it like he, it had a lot of indie you know film vibes and stuff yeah. like um, there's there's like there was some like car stuff that we did without like it was like indie <laughs> movie stuff that I was like I could you know I could do that at some point also I was in an episode of second season and then just the like, I played like um, the, the the Mexican guy's cousin, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and um, the, the memes and the stuff that, cause you know, she like, she read people to filth, especially the white boy and um, all the memes that came out on Twitter and Instagram, I was like, there's a lot of power in television, which I hadn't experienced. Even when I had a big show at the Goodman or at Steppenwolf or Oregon Shakespeare Festival, that's like 1300 seats or something. I don't know what that big theater is, but um. I'm like, te television's where it's at to like, to reach the populace, you know? Like if you want reach mm -hmm. and to change perception, this is a powerful medium. And I, that's when I was like, oh, I like this. I like this a lot, you know? So do you feel like you got past the imposter sy syndrome by being around people who shared the same values as you could see? Oh, no, okay. <laughs> I, I still have that. I still have that as I sit here having had a show. Like that. that's not gonna go away. And I don't know if that's process. I don't know. Cause I still, even with my friend, like I'm on a thread with the Untitled Latinx Project, which is this group I started. Um, and <laughs> every day I'm like, why do I have such a bad self-esteem? Like, what is, like, like if I don't know what I'm doing, which obviously I do know, but I have no idea. Imposter syndrome every day. I don't know. I'm dealing with it. CBD, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's good for everyone to know because then they know yes. that you're not alone. Like even if you're super talented and you're amazing and you know, you know what you're doing, you can still struggle with that. Yeah. 
So, Even if you're not like, I know it's like two brains. I know I can deliver because I have right. various times. And then I also, I'm like, oh, I'll never deliver again. Oh my God, I know how to do it there. And I know that I'm not, blah, 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 blah. you know? that is real and it's like playing even right now like why are they doing a thing on me like you know but that's um i think that's just me but i know that it happens a, a lot exactly. um i know that it happens with people that are percent as really self-assured and you know like maybe cocky or assholey and it's like no it's because we're all so like insecure but but that's normal same thing when you like i'm here starting this uh, like a pilot here i came to write something and then i'm like oh my god i don't can't write i don't know how to write i know how to write it's just that conversation you always have the like el angel y el diablo you know like talking to you yes i can no i can yes i can it's just yeah or your parents sometimes if you're a person of color you come from a certain community it's like right. they're gonna be like no puedes no debes, debería ser doctor, I don't know, you know? Uh, yeah, it's too late for that. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, can you tell me what your biggest lessons were um, that you got from being in the writer's rooms of these different shows and how that helped shape um, how you run your writer's rooms, whether it's like how you manage writers, um, you know, in, in that, con like in, in terms of developing pieces or just like takeaways that you're like, I will never run a show that way, or I, I love to run a show that way. Like I love what that person did and how they came to, came to these answers. Please ignore my COVID hands. It was open here when I went to the nail shop and now I can't stop doing this, it's gel. Um, I, I learned a lot about what not to do on Devious. Um, mm -hmm. there, was, there were some just racist moments. I'm just gonna, you know, and my friend Gloria and I, uh, we were on a panel and she outed it and I'm like, okay, well, so we're out now. Like, uh, there was a moment that we were called spick and span. Yeah, it, this is 2013, right? And uh, like as a joke, the room joke, um, that type of leadership is of the dinosaur age, like, you know, um, so like, the way, the way I had felt other eyes, another, I mean, it was like daily stuff, you know, mm -hmm. all these micro that I was like, never like just, you know, also that guy who we've made peace. Now we like friends, everything's fine. I've talked it out. Um, but the guy who called, you know, like do your diversity hire was like, cause we got into it in, in our offices. Cause I was like, if I ever get one of these rooms, I want an all Latinx writers room. And he read me to filth. He was like, why would you limit yourself like that? Diki diki and all these things. And I was like, what? So like, I, I got all these no's there. It was not a good environment, right? Mm -hmm. But then, like I said, when I, I was on looking and it was not just creatively how like, so like I, almost everything I wrote in my scripts and my um, episodes ended up, a version of it ended up. So like, it was a lot of agency and it was like, oh, that's how you so like, like that's, a, you know, and then also we were all queer, everybody behind the scenes, in front of the scenes and that I was like, oh, so that's who's building this. That's something. And then I got to um, murder. I, I, I was quickly like I did a little stint on girls, but um, and I saw like female showrunners. I was like, it was the only time, you know, I was like, oh, yeah, two boss ass <laughs> ladies running the show. That's brilliant, you know. Uh, who also directed and were in it. I was like, oh, this is allowed. Okay. And then when I got to murder, um, um, how to get away with murder. Six out of nine people were of color in there of the writers. Mm -hmm. That's, that was a powerful thing to witness because when you're pitching, when you're, it's like, it's, it's good. You know, that was good. So like, by the time I got to, uh, Vida to advocate for, you know, an all Latinx writers room, I'd seen some models, you know, also Atlanta had just come out right before I, um, we were greenlit and stuff and I was having to pitch everything um, uh, to the network studio. And it was like, that's an all black writer's room. So we can have, like, it was like license, you know, um, too. So it was a, just a bunch of like permissions, you know? Um, also, and I'm gonna, I'm sure talk about her a lot, but, um, maybe I'm skipping, but like, the, I also, and part of the formula, I think the reason why I got an all Latinx writer's room is because my uh, covering executive there, her name is Marta Fernandez. So that's, that's the formula. We have to have people in yeah. there championing us and who get it, you know? So, um, 
Yeah. That's great. Um, can you talk, can you talk us through the process of staffing up a writer's room and like literally like what, what the process is for those who don't know, and then also what you're looking for in a writer, or what you feel that your runners are looking for when they're trying to build a team, right, uh, to, to fill out their, their room? Um, I, so I, I was just, uh, so the first, when I first got the green light for this, I had, it was crazy. I had two weeks to find the writers and close their deals. And if you're a writer, you know that that is crazy. That's insane. But like, I think they were like, you want this? <laughs> this is how we got to do it so that we can like make that whatever, you know, I think I read in one week, 152 scripts, like that's crazy, you know? So that was, it was a lot of, I didn't, I don't know. I, like, I didn't have a process when I first, you know, and I thought this was just this crazy thing, but I was just looking for voice. Mm -hmm. And now I think I would do it a little differently. I would look for voice, but also um, experience. But I was like, because I didn't have experience, I didn't value that. And I'm glad I didn't. Cause like, um, you know, we did have a position uh, that first uh, every year, but like that, um, that is the diversity hire position, but I did not allow, I was like, we cannot use that term. We can say the funded position, but we not say diversity higher. We can't say the D word. <laughs> um, but, so, but, but, and that person never knew that, um, she was the, the, you know, funded position because that it didn't matter, you know, like she did I, I did value her, you know? So like, but like, it was a lot of, new, and she'd never, you know, done TV before. It was a lot of new voices or people like, no, I think I just had one upper level level um who was from Boyle Heights and stuff but everybody else was like new voices or or mid to or lower level writers that just felt right so it was voice you know and I think season two I did it the same way again uh and then season three I just um I did want to give opportunities to like a lot of uh for first time writers it was like so like the first um so like half the room was like come on so you can get your WGA card that's important too you know, like um, not just the the writers, but the, it's important to like if I um, can open the door. You know, like I can like let's let's let in pe some people. You know, and and start some careers. Like my my uh, cinematographer had never uh, run her own uh, unit. She was in second unit uh, um, for Narcos. That's where she did. You know, that was her only TV that she'd done. She'd done films. You know, but she's like this Afro Latina badass genius that um sure it, it was bumpy because she'd never run a 36 person department but we, we held her hand through it and now i can't get her she's super fancy she's doing high fidelity do you know what i mean that's exciting right and the I, point is, is that oftentimes people other people get those opportunities right so because yeah. they're talented and they get the opportunity to to show and prove and a lot of times we don't. So if we don't have people who are championing us to right. give us the opportunity so that we can show that we can do it, then, you know, it's it's a moot point. And I got championed and I got, you know what I mean? Like Marta Fernandez opened the door for me. So it was like, we got to do, we got to do a chain here. Exactly, exactly. Um, can you talk us through um, how you run a room? Everything from the blue skies brainstorming to assigning uh, writers to scripts to managing feedback from the network. We also, I saw also a question that fell into this same category of what does it mean to break an episode that came from Tony? Yeah, yeah, because in some shows people break their own episodes and stuff. I think um, we do a lot of collaborative stuff. I arrived in the season with like a sketch of what I want to achieve, you know? And then we sort of, um, in the blue sky, uh, so we blue sky, but we also find the like themes from the sketches I've made. Mm -hmm. So I want this to occur for her. I want this to, so, so this character has a win. So like, it's a lot of talking the first week um, and we card. So like, <laughs> I have my cards or my, my cards here in this kitchen um, for this thing. Uh, we card general stuff first, right? By character. So it's like, this is what we want to happen, but really general stuff, you know, even sometimes it's like, we, she starts here and she wants to end here. And then we have to figure out the way, you know, the way her arc, right? Um, and you're talking and about the cards. character, like see, well, season arcs for characters, right? But it's like really general stuff. That's what goes up on the walls first, really general stuff from my sketching that I've sort of told them, I'm thinking, you know, this and this. Uh, and then it gets more specific, especially as, as the days go and the week we start, I think by episode three, this should happen. So we start 
with episodes. Like they start, they start sort of populating the, the boards episodes. And then it just sort of happens like that. It gets fat like that. Like we like um, fatten it up with story and stuff. Uh, what it means to uh, break your own episode, at least for us, we, we do it together. We, but, but I, but I know there's other shows that uh, you bring and you pitch your episode, you know, um, we, we do, we do it together. <laughs> all that talking that I complain about, we do all that. <laughs> I mean, now I do that, <laughs> but I do, um, I do like to, yeah, get out, get out of the room kind of fast. Um, but our outlines that, so the first thing we do, well, the first thing we do is we go pitch it to the network, right? Ne uh, network studio was the same thing um, for us at stars and uh so we do a like dog and pony show of like ta da what you think you know uh with like a powerpoint and i act out all the characters but i don't think that happens all the time but um but my friend roberto Hirosa casa he um he does um riverdale and sabrina and stuff and he um he was like i perform i'm like i'm gonna perform too okay great so like <laughs> i took that from him um yeah. And then from their questions, you sort of adapt and then you go and you start like, let's start really building this and start, you know, giving them, and we give them an outline. Um, my outlines are shamefully long and I don't care. I'm, I like that. So some showrunners like, like a glorified beat sheet or like just the like story beats. I like swagger and hustle and flavor and I want them to know that this is what they're going to get in the script form even some dialogue which some showrunners are super like really not me <laughs> I want to see because we're gonna make it better you know um but but yeah I like the big shape so like out of a 30 it should be like a 28 to 30 page script it, it, they end up being um like 18 page outlines it's really shameful but that's fine this is this is this is who we were um <laughs> it worked because we did like we didn't get a lot of notes um because that we got notes because we were so thorough you know what i mean i mean we did we got notes and by the time we got to script it it was great because like they saw what it was going to be mm -hmm. at least that's how it worked you know um so we didn't have a lot of drafts of the scripts um because we did all the work in the outlines you know um it's funny right now i'm not working i started with an outline i was like so now I'm like going straight, which is not advisable, but going straight to dialogue because I, I, I need to hear how these p new people talk, you know, especially because half of them are Brits. I'm like, ah, how do they talk, you know? So like different things require different processes, I guess. Absolutely. And also it's totally different when you're really in like early development and you really yeah. do need hear voices than when you're actually, you know, you're, yeah. you're on the road, you're out yeah. there, you're, you're producing scripts. So that's, that's, yeah. yeah, totally different. Can you talk to me a little bit about, and then I'm going to probably, um, and I have two questions and I'm going to jump to some questions that were asked before. Um, can you talk about, uh, uh, about running the actual production while uh, running the writer's room? Can you explain your responsibilities in terms of approving casting and wardrobe and locations and blah, 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 while you were also um, running the room, you know, finishing that up and then going into, into production? It was just a very small overlap because we did uh, aim and for the most part, for the most part, um, achieve for like except for like the last episode for of everything um we wrote most of the episodes before we got to production production by pre-production we were overlapping but it's um you know uh i'm super hands-on with uh, i mean of course i'm uh, uh, with casting but like one of my best friends carmen cuba was my casting director too and we like have a shorthand and i so enjoy so like that stuff like i i would give her a heads up from outline or like we're gonna need a you know mm -hmm. gender queer presenting tiki tiki, tiki tiki you know like what, whatever it was so like it was it, that that is always a joy i love working since theater i've loved working casting maybe it's because i'm a former actor that is like um i don't know um but but it 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 wasn't seamless but it was it was fine. I mean, uh, uh, you yes, uh, casting, uh, but also you're hiring your first AD. You're hiring your, um, uh, you know, um, the, the second season. Yeah, we added a, a, a DP second season. And then we had this mess with the, the DP the third season who quit three days before production, which you had a day to find a DP. Thank God we found this amazing, like flexible, um, uh, lovely, um, um, woman who like pivoted was like yep whatever it needs to happen so like you know we had been um 
we had been um, in pre-production for two and a half weeks. We had to keep, we had to do it every weekend for the next week. It was, there were no free days. You know what I mean? It was crazy. Like they had to scout during the, it was crazy. Cause anyway, <sighs> anyway, when people quit like that, oh my God, all the shade. Yes, absolutely. Um, oh, that's just like bad karma three times three anyway. But, um, uh, so, so that's, so you're, but, but it's very doable. I mean, it's like, it's like you're an adrenaline cause you, you're excited to like be, be, be shooting and, and all the meetings just happen, you know, the interviews, the casting happen Cause now it happens, you know, on your computer, unless it's a big role and then you go in and work with them, but that's all, you know, what it's just very, um, it's very manageable. Um, I was so afraid of it you know, when, when I was like, Oh my God, but it's, you just do it. And it's, um, a lot of adrenaline and, um, and you have, excited. would you have any advice for like earlier you about show running that you now, like you would reflect back and say anything, or do you feel like, you know what, it all kind of turns out. You just have to trust yourself. I mean, yeah, it does. And also you have a lot of help. I mean, you have to be there every step because you are the final yes and no. Like you're the final word, but, and to be the final word, you have to be informed, you have to be engaged, right? So mm -hmm. it's exhausting, but you have so much help of people who really know what they're doing. Um, so as long as you keep up, are respectful of the process, which is like, answer everyone, people cannot move forward mm -hmm. without your approval. And like, that's the worst thing that um, show owners can do, make like the art department wait, and you have a day for, to build it and the, no, respect everyone. Everyone's role is important. You know, and uh, now, yes, I'm very partial to the writers. Like the writers are my everything, you know? And mm -hmm. sometimes I'm too, but like you have to be, I, production is, I, I love production. I love the way Vida felt. It was, um, it was very Spanglish set. You know, it was like very, like us, very um, like a family. Um, so I'm going to take um, some some questions that I got beforehand. I had a few questions about starting your career. So I had a, a question says I'm a freshman in college and I don't know where to start. Um, you mentioned something about like you know taking uh, classes that sort of thing. Um, so, but I, so I'll just focus first on the writing and then I have a question about um, trying to find work as an as an actor as well. But um, do what are your thoughts about one like courses that people should take. Uh, anything that they should prepare themselves if they're trying to get into TV, um, just in terms of roads or anything like that, if they're starting off. So obviously the thing I was missing was classes, right? Like actual, uh, the, the, the technique is super important to know so that that's not a worry so that you don't have to stay like I did till 11 PM every night, learning final draft, learning how long of scenes should be. I mean, I was, it was crazy. Like, you know, so, but, but so technically now, if you're want to aim to be a comedy writer there i think i think taking either improv classes or that that stand-up class it's kind of good it's I'm not saying you're going to be an improv it's just it's really good exercise you know yeah. drama um it's more it's more like you don't stop developing your voice even at freshman level like don't stop because you want to arrive as fully fleshed as you can um don't stop like uh uh, uh one pilot is not enough two pilots is not enough like it's for it's for you to get you know used to your own voice and be like oh that's that's who I am that's what I sound like so like um it's important to that at this stage uh mimicry is secondary because you will I mean when you write for a tv show you are a writer for hire you are a renderer you render content at the stage where you're writing your pilot you're a writer a creator you know um, so that's where the voice comes in and you will have to mimic like the showrunner's voice, you know, at some point, but that's a second right now. It's like, I, I really think developing your voice um, and then doing something that catches fire. So what does that mean? Well, we have YouTube now we have um, something catches fire either, you know, people put shorts or skits or web series. I, I, the way I caught fire was through theater that way, you know, um, it's just a storytelling way to catch fire so you can, because there's so much, I mean, there's so many people trying this and it's like, you just have to like, you just have to identify you and be like, oh, that's that voice, undeniable, right. you know, and be absolutely und undeniable in your voice. Um, another question, and then I'm going to go to uh, to some of the questions I, that I had. Um, um, 
So many. Uh, I, I saw some questions uh, for people who are outside the U.S. who are trying to come into the U.S. and break into the market. Um, one I saw for acting. Um, another one, I, you know, I believe was for for writing. Um, do you have any thoughts for you know trying to come here? I know that you're. That's not you know your story, but like, do you have thoughts? Because I like to, I have one from Argentina that I'm like, oh, I don't know. So like, you know. Well, it's be listen. I'm not a citizen still. So the first thing when you said that, I was like, oh God, work out your paperwork, you know, like your immigration stuff. That's really hard in the US. So like, you know, I'm still not a citizen. I'm still trying to be. Um, so, it, it, uh, and I've been here most of my life, but um, but so like that is is like, and I've, I've, I have so many friends, actor, writers that are there or have been there. And it's been like, because they just thought it was gonna work out once they were, you know, but it's, it's really hard, but right now we're in a zoom room moment where i know that if if you're allowed to work in the us um some people are working um from here from 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 england in in, in writers rooms i mean all the same thing with uh new york and and la and chicago people are like people are working from anywhere you know so in that regard this is the moment for that like be like oh, i don't want to necessarily move but i could you know now there's less rooms uh, and the competition's, you know, hard, but, but I'm just saying that's a reality. Um, and then for acting, ooh, so like a lot of, a couple of my best friends, actually my best friend from Argentina, uh, who looks like an Irish girl, but has a, a thick um, Argentine accent and is unwilling to fix it, um, is, it's complicated here because like we, unfortunately, not here, over there, in the US, you know. <laughs> like um the cat the roles that they're casting have a certain like um presentation do you know what i mean so like like figure out um if you can work on those accents i just watched especially two really good friends that just like gave up because they were like well they should embrace me with my accent it's like you should be able to i mean when when the brits come when the australians come they can uh, recreate um, different types of American accents. We, I mean, anywhere you come from, from the world, um, unless you're willing to be sort of pigeonholed that way, you know? But but then besides that, forget accents or immigration, start like everybody else, right? Like um, there's classes, there's uh, commute, like if you're a writer, writers groups are so valuable because like, the, it's like not just networking, it's support, peer support. That's mm -hmm. really, and, and acting too, same thing, take classes, peer support, um, and then get to, you know, the networking stuff. Oh my God, it, this, this sounds like such boring advice, but it's, you know, what I've observed. Right, but life lessons, it's just true. Yeah, yeah. Um, so can you talk to me a little bit about, um, oh boy, I'm, okay. Um, I was like, let me choose, okay. Uh, can you talk to us a little, little, little bit about um, the, the Latinx uh, Talent Lab um, as well as the end uh, Latin exclusion, the hashtag, like, like just, just, yeah. So two things. So uh, the, I just uh, found a new home, um, um, uh, universal content and, um, and they're giving me a, a Latinx lab, like a, an incubator, you know, um, which we're still coming up with the title. So there's, this is very early days, except it's happening and it's really exciting. And it's, um, it's just meant I, I've seen a few holes in uh, so like sometimes they make us repeat um, like like repeat levels or get stuck in levels like the you know in the way that some men of the dominant culture don't do you know and so like um, a, a, like and also it's hard to enter uh, for a lot of us we don't have um, uncles and tias and dads that you know are in the industry that just like let us in so they're there it's a three-part um lab and it, it's meant to serve like uh pre-wga um uh, emerging writers then that those uh writer sorry i just lost the slide um it, the writers that um that are in mid-level get stuck you know mm -hmm. and then and also like pre-showrunner showrunner so it's like this three-phase lab that um, i'm excited to roll out it's all like application, it's all like, and then it's like fellowship and stuff. So we, people will hear about it, um, they'll be able to apply. Um, and I'm super excited about it that, um, you know, there's different um, 
I've been watching Isa's and Lena's and Ava's like different kind of incubators and support. Um, and I've just been like, oh, we need a Latinx one. We need a Latinx one, you know? So the fact that um, he's yeah. giving me the money and we're going to have it, it's all, there's also going to be town halls and like uh, summits and salons. And so it's like, it's going to be amazing. We just have to poco a poquito, despacito, you know what I mean? Just a little bit. Exactly, exactly. And can you talk a little bit about um, what inspired the, um, I mean, it's obvious, oh, but right, right. inspired the, uh, the hashtag, I mean. It, it, it's, yeah. Well, it's, it's a whole thing. So, so um, I have to give credit to, I, I spoke a little bit about the Untitled Latinx Project, mm -hmm. which is this group of 18 women. So 17 women and, and, and me that I, um, I'm always talking to Gloria Calderon Kelly. She's like my, but now like we're inseparable, you know, we like on Marco Polo all the time. And, um, and uh, we have been there for each other as our show. She got her show first and then I got my show, but we, we've been like these, like we formed the sisterhood of support of like, Hey, this contract, do you think, how did you talk to your line producer? Da, da, da. Like stuff that like, because we didn't have mentors. We didn't have like these Latinx that all had shows that could mentor us, you know, that we grew up. In the, so we, you know, we did it for each other. And then I was like, I was watching as like, Linda Yvette Chavez and Sierra Ornelas y, y, y Lana Peña were about, you could see they were about to have shows, you know, mm -hmm. um, that I was like, I think they need this that we have, you know, because it's so lonely and it's like, you're in your, you're in, like in your corner and like, you don't have that guidance. Cause it's, it's, yes, the normal showrunner, first time showrunner guidance, but it's also, mm -hmm. uh, layered because of who we are, you know, because of our identity. So I got, I was like, well, you have a proper grown up house. Can we use it for a dinner? Cause I don't have a proper grown up. Anything. So uh, look at my Airbnb kitchen. Um, but like she has everything, all the plates and stuff. So we had like an, a dinner, it was lovely. And you could like, there was, we were thirsty for that sisterhood, like from that, you know. So then, um, and it's all these like boss ass Latinas. It's almost every Latina in Hollywood. I mean, Latina showrunner in Hollywood, almost, you know? So it's really, it's a really amazing group. And we, and then we, we partnered with a um, blacklist to do a Latinx TV pilot. And that's amazing. Cause we got to like read and support the, the, the 10 winners of the list or the, you know, and then they got three, um, uh, uh, three of them got Hulu blind script deals, which was like, this is like, like exactly what we want to do. Like, mentorship like but like and access in that level you know then we, then um you know we have meetings every month and uh and we'd be like ticket ticket i mean it's like part griping and complaining about like hey, you know what my story said dig it, dig it, you know and also real shit you know <laughs> like real like that only we are dealing with you know specifically and then half our moms and we're dealing with this um this moment and stuff and um like four months ago, Glad Gladys Rodriguez, who who worked um, uh, with me on Vida and who is this like amazing um, woman, she was, we were having a meeting, a Zoom meeting, and she was like, we need to do a letter. We need to do it. Cause we, we'd been complaining about these things. What we were on the letter, we were complaining about it. We need to do it like, and hold people accountable, hold Hollywood accountable. So it started when I was still in London, like, to, like four months ago, like I said, and I mean, in London and LA and, um, we we just it took four months because like we needed to get the right you know and also when would you put it out like and then we got these 276 signatures that was the most exciting thing because now there's this group with so much weight and be like look at us we're here and look at these names and like and if you really like excavate and look at the bios we've been here working now so we're ready like we are legion. No, I'm kidding. Um, like it's like it's like we're we're ready. So like that was exciting. The the getting the signatures and the conversation around that, you know, and getting like Roberto and like Lin Manuel and everybody just be like, you know, and and the hashtags were, you know, we came up with them as a ULP. Now it started as a as a ULP initiative, but it's much bigger than that. I mean, anyone here can sign um, the petition and please sign it because um we wanted. I mean, I think those uh. Are important things uh, uh you know no stories about us without us seems simple but it's actually yeah radical because that's not how that's not how this business has worked you know historically yeah. um can you talk a little bit about all right all right i'm gonna get to every, everyone's question but we just want to ask one quick question um can you talk about um feeling the the feeling whether or not you 
have to have to write only about Linux experiences? Um, or like, do you feel pigeonholed in a way? Because one of the uh, questions that came in prior to was, um, uh, you know, as a woman of color, I feel like I'm expected to write the stories of a, of the black struggle, but I want to write about things that I dream about as well. And it's kind of talking about, you know, as a writer, being able to talk about your experiences, um, be, you know, beyond what, what you specifically are. But then also I wanna ask on the opposite side, what are the challenges of writing intersectional characters? Like when you look at Vida, the thing that's so amazing about it is that you see, you, oftentimes you do not see queer stories. You definitely don't see queer, you know, of color stories, you know, um, and, you know, trying to feel, trying to get out of that quote unquote pigeonhole if you do decide to tell those stories, right? It's like a double-edged sword, like you, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. So I just want to know about your experiences about that. First of all, so I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll speak to people of color, BIPOC people. Um, right now, we should be able to write whatever the hell we want because historically we haven't and we, and there's a power structure here, right? Like we have not been allowed to tell our own stories for so long, or we've been giving babysitters or we've been giving crutches or whatever, like that are not like, and we haven't been able to tell the stories of the dominant culture, which we are steeped in. Like we, we can, we can tell that story because we cannot escape it, you know? Um, and also the story that she's saying that she dreams of, like, like we should be allowed, not just as artists, I'm talking about BIPOC artists, you know, to be allowed to be telling whatever story. So I, and if, if she's feeling pigeonholed, God, I hope that she doesn't allow that to happen. I only, I, I only want to tell Latinx stories. I don't feel pigeonholed. I don't think there's a limit. Like the stuff that I have coming up now, it's so many worlds. We, we have especially, so I'm being myopic right now. So Latinx have not gotten a chance to, to tell that like origin story because there's 27, there's there's 27 countries that make up the Latin, Latin diaspora. Right. Like, you know, like the, the um, genre um, stuff, you know, like uh, we haven't got like fantasy stuff. Like uh, it's, there's so much stuff. Like there's not a rom-com that we've had. Like there's not like, you know, so like, I don't think I'm going to run out of stories to tell, you know, I don't feel limited by it, but I hate it when people feel, um, my people feel limited by like that, that they only will get, um, if they want to write like, um, a certain type of genre, you know, and they only get like the, like, like we all do a lot of us like, here's cartel, you right. know, like the stuff. And you're like, none of, none of us want this, you know, um, I we're so fatigued with the cartel narrative, you know? Have ever gotten pushback that like Latinos don't act that way, or are you speaking to like is your voice representative of the Latina experience at all? Wait, what do you mean? Like for instance, like you know when I one of the things that I found interesting about Vida, I went to a screening that you had. I think it was part of Outfest, and you were talking about. Um, how a lot of people are like, oh, it's a queer show. But the, the funny thing is, is that there's also a sister who's straight in this story. And there's a feeling of wanting to say, especially with you know network marketing, and I know they have their job to do and they know they need, they need to reach out to specific demos and blah, 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 blah. But sometimes it does feel like even when we're telling universal stories, even you know that there's this <laughs> trying to like, um, um, uh, kind of like put us in this kind of group that everyone has this like all like every like you just said like not all Latinos are are are, are Mexicans so like no I can't tell you know the story of somebody from Belize actually like right. and that's not my job right so just I, I was wondering whether or not you are, at any point deal with feeling like you the weight of having to tell everyone's story because there are people pushing back on you saying that you're not representing everyone within such a diverse group. <laughs> People have been, I, I got, you know, Twitter has come for me for, for having such a light skin um, be that, which is the right thing, you know, to, to do. There should be more um, indigenous and, um, you know, um, Mestiza have more indigenous like descent. I get, I, I get that um, complaint and I listen to it. Um, I, with my slate that I want to do now as a, a producer, I do feel a responsibility to tell um, Afro Latinx story um, Brujas is going to be that. Um, um, I'm looking for a, a, a native creator so I can uh, partner with them because for, to me, the Latinx diaspora is that, it's vast, you know, and we are a lot of things. So I do, as a producer um, now, feel a responsibility 
um, to Latinidad, which I know is getting canceled right now. That's the conversation. Latinidad is getting canceled. Right. But our construct that we that we umbrella under, you know, I do feel a responsibility, not always to tell it myself, because I do. I want to follow that no stories about us without us thing too, you know, and we are such a, you know, a complicated people, you know, community that, yeah, like we, we have to like, uh, really, I, I'm trying to pay attention to that, you know? So, um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit, this is from Leticia about, uh, how do you work on multiple projects at once? If so, or I'm sorry, do you work on multiple projects at once? If so, can you talk about how you manage them, i.e. time and writing? Cause I know you're developing something right now. So what? Well, how are you um, doing? Not very well. No, I right now I can't that I write, I can only do two at a time. But some people I have friends that are developing a bunch of stuff and they're not so much like they can do so much. It's whatever you realize that you have the capacity to do. You have to make that realization yourself, you know. Some people are great at like multiple like two, two, two. I I've I've seen that I can only do this. You know? Right. So um you just have to, I'm really bad. I'm a Sagittarius, so I'm bad at discipline, but um, you just force yourself to write. Deadlines, right? Deadlines work. Yeah. I moved myself to London in COVID, like in, during the pandemic, because this show takes place in London. And I'm like, I'm going to be a Mexican in London. <laughs> I love it. And that's what the show is and just force myself. Now they're locking us down and like, I can't really, anyway, but it's, yeah. I didn't know, I was like, I need to do something drastic. I'm going to London. Um, can you tell us um, about, um, how is it like, this is from, uh oh, I'm gonna mispronounce your name. I think it's Elzer. Um, how is it How is it like to pitch a script to a network when you're beginning this road as a showrunner and a screenwriter? So I didn't pitch Vida. They pitched it to me basically so that's the big secret that i haven't pitched that much um but like the thing i sold to hbo i sold the play and then brujas i sold my play because i'd written a play basically brujas. it's called enfrascada mm -hmm. um so that was like not easy but it was like here's a play you want to you want to buy it great you know they optioned it so like that's i didn't have to like do the whole thing you know uh then I sold something to Fox by accident at a general. Uh, I was like, you know, somebody should do, somebody should do like the Oristaya, but like a Mexican family in Chicago. And they were like, we're buying that. I was like, you know what the Oristaya is? Oh shit. I didn't think, I didn't think they were going to know a Greek check. That's, that's, that's a true story. So by the time I sold those, sold those, by when I sold um, those three things, by the time I got to, um, um, that be that actually, no, I sold, um, Brujas um, afterwards, uh, but it was just a play, and and it was a meeting with Marta Fernandez, who was like telling me about like, have you heard about gentrification, and um, have you heard about you know chipsters? I'm like, of course I know chipsters, but what's gentrification? We had such a good conversation. I thought I was there because I'd only been here three years, so I'm there three years. So I thought I was there to interview for that show to be one of the writers on staff, you know, mm -hmm. and she was like, well, can you create a show about gentrification? female centric and uh, in East LA. And I was like, wait, what? And then I called it Uta, I'm like, is this real? Or am I, yeah, 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 she wants you to. So it was that, it, I had like a prompt basically, like a writing prompt and then I came up with Vida. So like, um, that was that easy. I know that's not a good thing. You can I have to tell you, you have to get Gloria Calderon Kelly. She pitches <laughs> so much because she is the one who I go to was like, let me see your deck and let me see your, you know, stuff. Cause I really don't know how to pitch cause it all has happened by accident, you know? But right. now I'm gonna have to, now I have to, yeah. Right, but you had the story, you had the characters, you knew, yes. you, were, you know, like, so there's storytelling, a storytelling, a storytelling, whether exactly. it's a or if it's TV. I just didn't talk it out, but yes. yes, absolutely. Yeah, the world was there, you know, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm gonna keep on going. Uh, do, uh, um, let's see from Riley, uh, what advice do you have for gaining entry into the screenwriting and producing field as a woman? I'm currently in college and have no clue how to start. So besides the, you know, the technical know-how, and the, I feel like there, I've been seeing a few questions quite honestly about how to get into the industry. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I, there's another one, uh, from Sonia who says that, um, how can an older queer Latina from a different industry try to work in film and television? Um, so like this kind of like, how do I transition whether or not yeah. you're maybe early in your career or, or older in your career? What are, what's your advice around that? 
I transitioned kind of older. I mean, a lot of people start much younger in TV. So I had had 16 year career, you know, in, in theater and then, you know, so I get it and I get the fear. It's, this is such a hard question. And if like other showrunners were here, they, they would say the, and then and it's unsatisfying answer. Um, PA, PAing for a writer's room. Um, and then eventually being a writer's assistant, but how do you get those jobs? That is the quandary, right? right. Um, yes, who you know. And it's, how are you supposed to know people if you, you know, there are some lists going around, just so you know, like we, um, when we need a, like a, 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 a showrunner's assistant or a, a writer's PA or something, there are these lists going around that, um, that you can get on, you know, people who are willing to mm -hmm. do it, but it's, um, it's tough because people want people like with experience, but how can you get freaking experience if you don't? So um, Mike Royce, who is the kosher runner of One Day at a Time, and me, this is just a side note. So watch out for this. Um, we are starting a program with the Writers Guild Foundation for BIPOC support staff, potential aspiring. So it'll be an eight week program free um, uh, every like weekend. Um, and it, um, it's, it basically teaches you how to be writer's assistant and a script coordinator, which is invaluable because that's how you get a job in a writer's room. You know, I mean, that's not the only way you can also write a play, and then, but, but like there's other, but like a, a really like direct line uh, and uh, uh, is that way. So like watch out um, next year for uh, starting January for uh, applications for that BIPOC program. And because it's gonna be on Zoom, you can do it from anywhere. And that's the thing, like that's, I get, I get a lot of emails uh, from showrunners. Hey, do you have a bilingual or do you have a, a, a BIPOC um, uh, script coordinator? And there, there's not a lot because I think entry is tough. So we're trying to like help with that. Um, sorry, I'm just looking, trying to look through to see if I'm okay, yeah. Um. Can you talk to me a little bit about, whoa, um, I just lost it. Okay. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about um, your experience? I'm sorry. What are these questions? Okay. Um, <laughs> Can you talk to me a little bit about the um, the project that you're developing um, now? Um, not too much, okay. um, but it has something to do with music in in the British Indian music, and That's I'm excited. Cool. And it's exciting. I mean, I don't know um, when it'll happen. Like it's all because of COVID. Like you know, but it's exciting to be like coming to this world that is not exactly. I think what people are like. Wait your next show is going to be like Vida or something. And it's like, well, no, it takes place in London. And it's this, you know, so it, it's, uh, I'm, I'm excited. Um, and then hopefully Brujas um, will also. I, I've seen multiple questions about people talking about overcoming uh, negative feedback or, um, you know, some sort of like failure or being told no. Like what are, what's your advice for staying motivated when, you know, you're, you're, you're not being received, right? Because obviously there are times that you have been definitely received, right? And people, you know, can connected, but when you feel like you're talking to, you know, a room or a person who can't quite connect to your experiences. That's um, going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> that's going to happen. Now, the, I have, at every stage, I've had a group of fellow writer friends that are friends, friends first, but they're also writers. So when I first started, um, these playwrights that then moved on over here, like now there's um, another like showrunners and upper levels, but we were Chicago, we were in Chicago and we had a six person writers group and ha four of us came over here and they were, to, to be able to have experiences and go back to them and be like, this happened to me. And then to talk it out and have that support was invaluable. I have it now every day. I mean, with, with my thread of the ULP. So it's like, not just, um, but it's any decided, como se dice decided, like anytime that you like experience like a mic microaggression or like a doubt or whatever, it's so important to have a support group. I really believe it. Um, um, that's been made the difference for me because it's gonna happen. In fact, we, we're, we're dealing with somebody's like 
shitty behavior from some racist um, showrunner right now. And the thing is that she did what she can do. So we're there to support her now there, you know, and um, you know, her pain is our pain. And so we're there. And I feel like that finding a, like a support is, has, the, has been the only way that um, I've been able. And, and for a while it was, you know, uh, periods, it was like just glow, Gloria was my support. And that was a lot of burden for her, but like, you know, um, I do think that that's important. Yeah, I see, because I see a lot of questions here, to be honest with you, they're asking about connecting. Um, someone asked about uh, connecting with a, a producer, um, you know, and, you know, just trying to find a way in the industry. I see a, a ton of those, but I feel like a lot of what you're talking about speaks to that, like yeah. building a network, building whether it's where you're at or through these Zoom rooms that are, you know, creating opportunities for people, but because that's the only way, this, this is the people industry. Yeah, and it happened. It feels like, oh my God, there's no map. It's not that there's a map. You, it would, it is a moment where a lot of content is being created. It will happen. It just takes a lot of sacrifice and, and a cost to yourself, you know, cause like badly paid jobs or like a day job while you're trying to do it. But it, it does eventually, cause there's so much need at every level that it will eventually happen. You just have to keep doing it. And it's not pleasant and it's not glamorous and it's not cute and diggity, but it will happen probably if you stick with it. Great. I think those are, I feel like, do, 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 do. Mm, what? Hmm. Um, wow. Some of these emails are a little, I mean, these, these are, feel like more like emails. Hold on. Uh, so how to work. I don't know the answer to a lot of things y'all. So, um, so, sorry. So I'm going to ask one last question. Um, yeah. At the end of the day, um, what would you be kind of like your advice to younger you, right? Like when you first started writing, because actually if the two part question, one, did you always know that you were going to be a writer, right? Like at a super, super young age, but also like what would be the advice to younger you as you're starting out on this journey to allow you to have the perseverance um, or to at least make this road, which is very long, um, just more enjoyable. Oh. Oh, hold on. Ask me that one again. Let me answer the first one. First one um, was like, when did you know that you were a writer? Like, was um, that I, I was always a storyteller. I didn't always know I was a writer, but um, I was always like, um, since I was a kid, my parents were like putting me, or my abuelitos were putting me on the table and being like, um, tell a joke. Because I mean, in Mexico, you tell joke like jokes are like, and then, and like, that's the joke. Oh, she tells a great joke. The one joke that's in your repertoire, you know, or like a couple, um, or declamate. I was a big at, at school, like declamate, which was, like, you know, and then, um, I did join the like speech and debate team. And then you had to like change the script to fit like 10 minute or like whatever minute. And, um, that's when I was like, oh, I could do this better maybe than this script, or I'm going to write this line. So that's sort of when I, started like messing with it. And then by the time I got to Boston University, which is where I did my undergrad, um, they, they were, they were not the roles, they were not Latinx, like it was, you know, so I was like, I'm gonna have to write this for this. They had like a, a playwrights festival. I'm gonna write myself roles. And then that's sort of how it started. And when I started Teatro Luna, it was because I was doing um, like uh, the maid, auditions only you know just Mr. Johnson through here you know like that was it so I was like wait a minute I'm sh I went to Oxford for Shakespeare and um I'm classically trained I'm gonna freaking write myself so that's how that started and then by the time I was directing and acting and, and writing all the stuff for Teatro Luna I was like I think I like being a creator better more than an interpretive um artist you know story a storyteller that, which is acting and, and directing I was like I want to create so that's sort of when it switched and then and then it just stayed, you know, I mean, I, I guess I could still act, but it's like, um, like the, especially TV, I don't know, it, it, uh, uh, it's so such responsibility. Other people can do it. I, I haven't figured out how, but so that's that. Um, I was always a storyteller, you know, uh, I just had to figure out the genre and the format, you know, uh, what was the other question? About um, if you could tell younger you about how to like survive this long journey, right? Um, and to find joy in it. 
right? Like what, how would you, what would, what would be that suggestion to get you through like all the no's, all the, I don't know what I'm doing to even figuring out, thinking that you now know what you're doing, but then it's like, oh, there's something, there's a next level to this. What would be that advice? Well, like two, two things. I, um, I said it earlier, but the, um, if it's your parents, if it's you, whatever voices you have here that are toxic and we have them, we have them by our look. Sometimes we have them by our, our ability. Um, try, try to not let them um, get you. And that's a, that's a, a daily journey, like for me, but, but, it, but I'm so aware of them and I identify them. And I know when they start, when, like, when I start editing before I'm even writing, finish writing, whoa, 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 no, wait, you know, that, and then the joy, I, I've learned that you need to find the joy in life. And cause I've gotten really myopic about like, writing, da, 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 you know, the, the career, career stuff. And I forget to live and I ha that's happened. And, and it's so that's toxic too. Don't forget to live. If not, what the heck are you writing about? You know, even if you're writing about aliens, you have to live. You're still putting like humans in, in your movies or your, you know, um, TV shows. So like you have to live. Um, that's, I wish I would have told her more. Cause like, you know, like I wish she would have listened. <laughs> No, that's golden advice. No, seriously. Um, thank you so, so much for your time. Mm -hmm. Really, really appreciate it. I'm sorry, everyone, that I didn't get to all your questions. There were just too many, um, but um, thank you so much. Um, also, um, if anyone's interested, just to do a quick, you know, sell for the school, you know, if, uh, if anyone's interested, you know, in screenwriting, you know, New York Film Academy has a screenwriting department. So, and we also teach obviously on Zoom. So that's a thing. Um, if you're interested in following out oh, uh, in NIFA, you can go to www.nifa.edu. Um, if you're interested in following me, I'm on Instagram at the mighty dro. Um, and if you're interested in following Natanya, if you're haven't, or, or if you're not already, um, yours is, yours at Tanya Saracho, right? Tanya Saracho, yeah, on Instagram and Twitter. Great. Again, thank you, everyone. Oh, we were over time. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Tanya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.